Hey, welcome back to the Cash Beach and Lunch Hour podcast. This is your host, Aaron LeBauer, and today my special guest is Dave Baruch. Dave is a Australian physio, but I believe he's here in the U.S. doing some um, awesome things. Just launched a, uh, a product we're going to talk to him about in a few minutes. But uh, Dave, thanks for coming on the show. Appreciate you spending the time with us. Yeah, thank you so much. It's awesome to be on the show with you. Yeah, man. So, um, well, we connected a few years ago, and then you sent me a message recently. Where I saw your launch, and I wanted to, I was like, let's get you on the show and talk about this. Um, so, can you just give us a little bit of background on, I always want everyone to kind of connect with the listener. So, how did you get into physio in the first place? And then, you know, um, we'll, go, we'll start with that. Okay, so getting into physio, that goes way back. Um, yeah. So I guess that started with my first trip to the physio when I was uh, about 11 and I had Osgood Schlatter's disease. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that name was a big mouthful and I thought, wow, how do I have a disease already? Um, and then um, I was actually honestly kind of disappointed with the, the treatment that I got. Um, yeah. I, I'm a very, I love to understand how things work and that makes for a good physio, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, they told me what it was. It's very easy for the physio to tell you, this is what it is, this is what it's called. But I wanted actually a treatment that worked. Uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to get an outcome. And a lot of the times I'm getting electrical stim, I'm getting uh, hot packs with, I'm getting sticky. And I went to the, and then I went to Chinese medicine. I had the, the little, the salumpus patches. I had the red light. I had, you know, all this stuff. And, and, you know, none of that really did anything. I became the smelly boy because I had the patches on my knees and I had my knees wrapped and then I stopped playing sports and socially like that was not a good thing. Um, you know, I put on weight, you know, like I didn't get the treatment that I wanted to get and I was kind of a little disappointed and I, I sort of believed that physios and doctors basically were like magic healers. And then I realized that, you know, maybe there's more to learn mm -hmm. and I wanted to do a better job. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. So that's, so that's when you went in, uh, into physio into like a program. Did you do that in Australia or here in the yeah, US? Yeah. Physio. Um, so physio in Australia was really hard to get into. Yeah. And I, I wasn't, I was not an A grade student. Um, Me neither. <laughs> um, I was more of a, yeah, I don't know. I want to say I, I was not an A grade student. So yeah. um, I actually didn't get into physio and actually my, you know, my counselors were like, you know, really physio is harder to get into than medicine in Australia. Um, you basically need it at my time. You need a tertiary entrance rank of 97.5, which is out of a hundred. Um, and that's decided by your year 12 exams, not by, uh, other stuff. I was going to get 97.5 on average in my year 12 exams. So I did a health science degree and I like focused my direction. On, and then finally I, I got into physio as a, um, after my first degree. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, it was exactly right for me because I, I wasn't really, didn't really have the fortitude to be a doctor, honestly, like a medical doctor that is. Right. Uh, I don't really like blood so much. Not a big fan of vomit. Who doesn't really work for me. Um, <laughs> and also the stress and, and the hours, you know, like I, I like to just deal with the musculoskeletal and then go home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just, you know. Awesome. Awesome. So you did that in Australia. Like what brought you to the U S and you're in Miami now, right? Yeah. This, yeah. Miami. Um, uh, I do like warm weather. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of people do. Um, I guess, um, I, you know, Australia is an incredible country. I really love it there. Uh, I was actually originally born in Honolulu. Okay. So coming to America was not a problem. Um, coming to America with an Australian degree was. Mm -hmm. um, getting certified, getting a, a, a physical therapy license in Florida with an Australian education was very tricky. Um, so negotiating that took about 11 months from start to finish. Wow. Um, but it, I got it done and I, you know, the rest is history. Yeah. what you, so how old were you when you moved over here? Uh, that was in 2012. Um, I'm currently 40. So that was eight years ago. Um, I was 32. Okay. So you practiced in Australia for a while. Yeah. Right? Uh, you know what I, I did it, you know, I started a little later cause I did the first degree first and then I did a post. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I was, yeah, I practiced in Australia for a little while and I, and I got burned out straight away. Yeah. Uh, as soon as I went into private practice, my, the guy I was working for tried, he, he was excellent as a mentor, but he also recognized that I was a good workhorse. Mm -hmm. uh, so boy, did he put me to work. Uh, yeah. He made me, didn't make me, he offered me the opportunity of opening my own office in the first week that I started working with him in a gym. I did that. So I'm working two jobs at once. 
Um, and I just burned out. I just didn't want to do it anymore. I think mainly because I wasn't getting good results either. It right. wasn't fulfilling. I was doing the like what I had learned at school and it kind of, honestly it was kind of working 50% of the time and other, other times people would keep coming back and they weren't getting better and that was really draining. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I took a break and I opened a cafe. Yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> uh, but then I went back to physio and I had a really great mentor in my next job. And he was just incredible in terms of the way he worked. And I learned a lot and I learned more and then I moved to America. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And then you came here and it took you 11 months to get your license. So what'd you do in that time? So I have to say it took me 11 months to get my license from starting the application process in Australia. Okay. Um, I actually got my license in, um, I think it was November and I moved here in June. So there were a few months there where I had no job. Uh-huh. And I was yeah. living in savings and it was getting pretty real. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I didn't, I didn't work. Um, and I just studied that big thick phone book that you get for the, um, the entrance exam. The right. NP, what was it? NP, PE or something like that? I, got I don't know. NPTE. PE, something like that. I, um, I, I barely I, passed it myself. I don't know what it's called. <laughs> studied, yeah. Right. I just studied and studied and studied until I passed that exam. You know? Yeah. Okay. And, um, Let's see. So you're, you're, you're in and out of physio, you land in the U S and you're, you're getting ready to start up. Did you start your anatomy, physio, physical therapy, um, right away or no were way. you trying to do something else? No way. Um, American physical therapy is so different. Um, it's so bound by insurance mm-hmm. and rules, so many rules. Um, so I figured, I guess I have to learn the rules. Um, so I went to work in a, in a mill, like in a, in a, I tried to get a job and I got a job, which was great. Um, and I, um, went to the meetings at every Friday in the afternoon and heard all the rules that I didn't want to follow. Uh, this is how you build codes and you should, you need to get two codes with the highest billing rate for each session. And, and if you don't build the codes, you know, you're not making the right amount of money for us, mm-hmm. but you're responsible for building the codes, but really it's got nothing to do with what you, I mean, it was just terrible couldn't believe that everything was revolving around billing codes. You know, we don't do, we don't do that where I'm from. And I certainly don't do that now. Yeah. Um, and so that, that wore thin pretty quickly. And I tried to sort of do my own thing anyway, cause it, cause the most fulfilling thing about being a physical therapist is getting results for your patients. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just kept trying to get results, getting results for my patients. That meant spending too much time with them. I wasn't seeing enough patients per hour and ultimately I got fired. Yeah. Yeah. So you got, you got, did you get like a reprimand by the boss and they yeah. let you go? How did that? Yeah, many that times. Um, and then finally I was hit with a, um, a non-compete agreement. Um, and so then I was, that was like a sign this first and then do exactly what I say. And if I didn't sign the non-compete, uh, I'd be fired. But if I signed the non-compete, I would literally like, ruined my opportunity to ever do anything on my own for the next at least two years. I think it was. Yeah. I kept like filing it. Finally, I went on a holiday and it was too long for my boss and I was fired. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. And that was the best thing that ever happened to me. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened? Where'd you go? Did you go somewhere worthwhile or was it just down the street? I went to Australia to visit my family. Oh, Um, yeah. But I mean, that was too long. It was like, and I came back early to go back to work. I left my wife over there. Yeah. Uh, came back early, jet lag, fired that morning. And I just thought, you know, that's not very nice. Um, <laughs> so it's time for me to do my own thing. I don't have a choice. I really didn't have a choice. I, I had a daughter already and um, I, 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 had, I had to just do it. Yeah. Right there and there. So who do I look to? Look to the internet, look to uh, Facebook at the time. And there's Aaron Labauer saying, open your own practice. You know, here's the cash <laughs> PT blueprint. Just, just look at this and do this. And I'm like, okay, I'll do whatever he says. Yeah. And how'd that work out for you? It worked out really well. Um, you know, like, because when it comes down to it, I think it's about confidence. Yeah. Um, am I nuts, uh, for trying to open my own practice? Am I, am I delusional? You know? And then you're saying, no, you're not delusional. You can do it, (laughs) do it. And I'm like, okay. So I did. Awesome, Um, man. You were right. Yeah. Awesome. You can say that again. And my wife says, you're right, Aaron. And I was like, I know, say that again. So we always mm-hmm. say that to each other. But 
It is, it, but isn't it amazing? I, I think you said you don't like following the rules or you didn't yeah. like say that, you said you just don't follow the rules, right? Yeah, I can't right. do that. I couldn't do that. I couldn't right. do the, the billing codes. And... Why, like what is it about following the rules that the makes rules... it like so cringeworthy? Well, the right. problem is, like I said, is, is the key to having a fulfilling job or being a fulfilling, being fulfilled as a physical therapist is for me is getting results. Yeah. The, the rules don't allow you to get results. <laughs> That's the rules of the, the old style. And I say old style because everyone's got to head towards what we're doing. Mm -hmm. The rules of the old style don't allow you to get results for your patient. They are completely in opposite directions. Yeah. Uh, so if I follow the rules, I wasn't spending time getting results for my patients. Right. Right. Because the rules didn't allow you to sp spend quality time or do what you thought was right. Right. I have to investigate. I've got to, I've got to look at my patient. People are complicated. The human body is magical. You know, you've got to really look at them for an hour um, and watch how they behave when you experiment with their body. Electrical stim doesn't allow that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. They just sit in the corner. I think right now, I think it's going to be tough because there's clinics that just put 10 people in a corner all on e stim and hot packs. They're going to have to do something else with these patients and uh, they, th those, that model, as far as I'm concerned, I can't believe that's still running, honestly. Right. I, I don't understand how it works. And, and my patients don't want that. So, and, and the thing is, of course, there will always be patients who, who saw their parents doing that and mm -hmm. think that that's what physical therapy is and that's what they're buying. Right. That's fine. But that's, that's not what we're looking for. And the people we want are dying for what we offer. Yeah. Yeah. How are you finding those people? Okay. Like what's your what's your like number one strategy so the beginning was different to what it is now mm -hmm. um before i have to say I, I people found me because i already had treated them or someone in their family and then when i when i moved into my own practice which was by the way in my living room mm -hmm. um i already had a little client base of people who knew me and understood that i went out on my own and were willing to come to my apartment my living room um, but now it's about Google. Uh, yeah. Now it's about free advertising, which yeah. is Google Places. Yeah. Uh, and people, people are Googling physical therapy wherever you are. Um, and they're, they're looking and they're comparing how many stars do you have, how many reviews do you have, and how, how pretty is your, your website? Mm -hmm. or, or how interesting, or what's that experience going to be like if I go to him? Right. They're shopping for an experience. Um, and like, you should give it to them. Yeah. How are you giving, uh, like what's the experience you're giving your patients and how are you delivering that? So, um, it's multi, I mean, I'm trying to do any, everything that's different from a standard physical therapy office. Um, and that includes, um, accessibility. So I'm allowing my, all my patients book online. Um, yeah. I don't take any appointments, uh, myself. I don't have a receptionist. I don't have any staff in my office, it's just me. Um, so I'm not geared for that, I don't wanna do that. Um, mm -hmm. So patients book online, they prepay, all appointments are prepaid, no one comes into the office without paying for the appointment that they're attending, which, I mean, obliterates cancellations. Right. Um, and if they don't wanna pay up front, then they're not my kind of patient. Uh, and that's fine, because there's, there's a whole you know, distribution of people out there and, and you want the sort of patient, the person that appreciates you and respects your time, Mm -hmm. um, it, mean, it means your, your job is so much happier. Your job's yeah. happier. Well, you, you feel happier in your job. Um, yeah, they, they find you online. You, you let them book with an app. You never see them until they arrive at the office and then you introduce yourself and you get going. Yeah, yeah. What are you doing? Like, is there one thing? Because like, I could throw up like a, a crappy website and just say, hey, book online. And mm -hmm. people would be like, why would I book online there? Like, what that's are you doing common. between like, like what, what's the piece that you fit in between when someone searches for physical therapist or something on Google and they find your, like they, they book on your website. Like what's I would the piece say in there? Your, it's all about pictures. Mm -hmm. um, so it starts with your Google places listing or your website. I mean, I don't SEO my website because that costs money and, and I, mm -hmm. I wanna keep this as, you gotta keep a really lean ship. Um, so Google Places is free. I get all my patients, if it's possible, to review me on this, to build my Google Places um, uh, following, uh, not right. following, um, 
uh, strength in terms of how many reviews you have. Because mm -hmm. then all people are doing is looking at your business and the other physical therapy businesses, and you've got a hundred reviews and someone else has three and yours right. looks better. Yeah. Um, now you want the reviews to be genuine, sincere, and you know, comes back to you actually solve someone's problem. Mm -hmm. So you want them to write about the problem you solved. And then if someone looks and they have the same problem, they go, oh wow, okay, you know, there's no problem. They click on your website next because they want to know about what you do. And your website's got to show pictures of what you do because we like pictures. That's why Instagram's awesome. Right. Um, so bright pictures. Your office should be bright. Um, it should look different from a standard physical therapy office. It shouldn't look like a torture chamber. It should look mm -hmm. like a spa. Uh, you want to give someone a good experience. Um, so, you know, in the pictures, they're like, oh, that looks nice. I'd like to go there. Yeah. Um, and that's all happened before they've decided to come and, and see you. Um, but you can have videos, you know, on your YouTube. And you've got to have all this content that drives someone to say, I want to go there. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So you got people, they'll find you mostly through Google. They check out your website and they're, they're like, and I was looking at it, like you've got some awesome pictures on there. And they schedule, they get on your thing and boom, you're, you've got people in, they come in, they see you scheduled, paid, ready. They're ready to, and they're ready to go. Right. And then yeah. I mean, one other thing is like in America, and I've noticed the initial evaluation always costs more. Mm -hmm. Why? Right. I don't understand that. It's like saying, in case you were thinking about not coming, let me give you one more reason not to come. Here's a bigger barrier to entry. Uh -huh. Oh, no. like, 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 like bring them in, let the first session cost the same as the, as any other session. Um, your, your first session is your opportunity to shine. Yeah. Um, don't make it cost more. Um, not only that, but like it makes things more complicated. Why you have different pricing things? Like, you know, if someone comes to the session and they say, you know, I want to send my brother next time. Um, yeah. And you know, make it easy. Right. Uh, let them use one. I mean, I'm, I'm, you've got to be super flexible. Um, I let people use sessions from, from their package, and whatever. But we do packages to make things easier. I highly recommend that. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there are a few bits and pieces that I've learned along the way that really work and you just stick with what works. Yeah, so it sounds like it's, the, it's about the patient and customer experience and not like about what you need. <laughs> I mean, it fits what you need, but it's not like about you. It's about what makes it easy for them. So right. it is, I mean, I, I wake up in the morning and a patient's booked out their entire plan of care and I look at the emails and they're coming in at one o'clock in the morning. That's yeah. when they want to book their appointments, one o'clock in the morning. Right. Great. Um, I certainly don't want to be doing that at five minutes past the hour at the end of their session mm -hmm. when my other patient's waiting. Oh, I hate that. It's so awkward. Yeah. Um, everybody, you know, that makes it easier for them. But yes, but actually it does make it easier for me too. So right. it has to be win-win. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So Dave, you're like rocking and rolling in your, in your practice and uh, you've recently launched the calf pro, like you've got a, like a device for helping. So you're specialized in feet, right? Foot, feet and orthotics. This is the calf pro here. Yeah. Um, awesome. Where did this idea come from? Um, plantar fasciitis. Yeah. Um, so plantar fasciitis is that, that condition that no one fixes. Mm -hmm. and you're like everybody thinks they they sort of like yeah i fix plantar fasciitis but man do you really like it's really a tough one to fix and it started there and it was like you know what are the what are the factors and then it was achilles tendonitis and then it was you know uh, calf issues and knee issues and and they all seem to revolve around the calf actually mm -hmm. and then plantar fasciitis is one of those ones that is um, also foot alignment it's not just calf but when it came to stretching people's calves, they had a dysfunction in their calf, which means really the calf is really in lockdown in a sense, or really tight. Yeah. I couldn't find a calf stretch that worked. Mm -hmm. um, and I know everybody knows how to stretch their calves, but when you want to break that tension, you need a, you really need a tool. And I, and I, I, and I kept trying to find ways to help people stretch their calf, but when you need leverage, I had to make the tool. Um, so I mean, not because of what you're doing in the clinic, but more like what patients can do at home, right? Or uh, are they using this in your clinic? They're not just using this in your clinic only. This is also, I mean, this is very much part of an active treatment session. So yeah. I, so let's say I'm doing, so I also have a treatment system that I put in place for myself to make things easier, but to deliver consistent care. So mm. one of my treatments, what all of my treatments involve heat release stretch. 
So, you know, you do a stretch and I wasn't getting an effective stretch even right there in the office for that okay. treatment. So this yeah. was in office um, and I was finally getting a great stretch. And then people were like, oh, I need one of those once they fully experienced it. Um, can you sell me one? And I, the answer was really no. Sorry. I hate saying no, but I couldn't. Yeah. Uh, and so Why did you make the first one yourself? Uh, 3D print. Yeah. Uh, it's over here. This is like the, the sorry, this is like the you know, heavy uh, 3D printed model. Nice. I still use every day in the office. This is really heavy. Um, and this I use as a treatment tool for um, any calf stretching. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I wanted to make it uh, collapsible. So this one collapses. Okay. The button here, the whole thing, you know, collapses. Nice. Um, and so now I can, you know, give it to the world. But in essence, the, the point of it was first for office treatment. Yeah. Um, but then everyone's like, well, I need one because the, the thing is you start with, with all stretching, you got to do it regularly. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise you regress. And with walking that, you know, you use your calf to walk every step. So you go to Disney or, you know, you go for a holiday, your calves tighten up. It's nice to go, just put, put on the calf row, stretch for 30 seconds and you unlock and you're good. Yeah. Cool. So how is this different than just like a straight up wedge or hanging your foot off like a curb and or right. a two so, by four that, you know, some people have in their clinics. Um, so, you know, everyone right now, everyone who's seeing the device either get it or they say exactly like, Oh, I can just put my foot up against the wall or mm -hmm. I can just drop my heel off a step. This is ridiculous, you know? And, and so, you know, dealing with people who we don't see what it is and, and bring negative energy has been a bit of a journey as well. Yeah. Um, but I realized that, you know, that's not, it's not my job necessarily to tackle those people. We're just, you know, lead with love in those situations. Yeah. yeah we absolutely. really understand that they don't, they, they, I would have been the same in their position probably. I, I feel that, you know? Mm -hmm. it's down, sorry. So how is it different from using a, um, uh, a wall, for example? Um, yeah. As soon as you put your foot up against the wall, um, your angle always changes. Now I'd say to you, please make a 45 degree angle on your foot for consistency and measuring. And I want to measure, right? So you stick your foot there. And as soon as you drive your hip to the wall, the very first thing that's going to happen is you're, you're going to slide down. So you've lost your loaded stretch there. Mm -hmm. You're bending your toes backwards and your heel's sliding back and you're not getting the best possible stretch. Um, you're talking your plantar fascia, you're bending the, you know, your, your big toes, sesamoids, everything's being pushed backwards. Um, and you, as you slide down, your stretch is being lost. Right. Um, it's not effective. Um, then there's the heel drop. Um, basically you use body weight there. And if you need more than body weight to stretch your calf, which you do because your calf is a leveraged muscle that can lift your entire body weight. So you need to almost like push down and then you slide off the step. It's really not an effective way to stretch your calf at all. Um, you wow. once you use yeah. it, you go, oh wow, I get it. Uh, this, this is totally different. I've yeah. never felt my calf stretch like this before. Got it. So you're struggling with like, how do you, how do you help some of these patients in the clinic because they're doing different angles, different things. And you came up with this was, was did this just like come out of like your head or, you know, like, like, were you like, Hey, if I, if I only had this tool, but it did this and this and this, and you built it, like, how did this come to come together? Well, first, I mean, all I was doing was putting people's foot up against the wall and doing a hip to the wall stretch. And I was getting them to put their own foot behind their foot. So it wouldn't slide back. Mm -hmm. um, and then they just, their foot would come out of their shoe. Yeah. It's that it's that much le you need like three 400 pounds of force to stretch a calf because i mean a calf can lift your whole body weight easily mm -hmm. it's highly leveraged you need a lot of force um so it's coming out of this shoe so i'm like all right so i need to make like a you know like i i drew a picture and I, it's on my instagram my my original calf pro picture was a drawing on my notes on my phone i'm just sitting there like trying to doodle you know um yeah. and like where's the calf pro and you know, it was this at first, which is, um, that was it. Uh -huh. It's like, it was like a little, little peg to hold the back of your shoe while it's on the incline. Right. So it turns out that that wasn't good enough because I actually needed people to stretch without their shoe on because they just come out of their shoe. So then I had to have a heel holding device and it, and it evolved from there. Right. So you put this up on, I just want the people to listen. Like I'm, I know, like I'm looking at, it, but you had like you put it up on Kickstarter. Might not have been the first, but you had you've raised almost three hundred thousand dollars for this. 
uh, that was on Kickstarter and now yeah. we're on Indiegogo. Yeah. Um, and we've moved a little beyond that now, which is good. Okay. Um, and I feel like that's an, honestly like, that's without any media coverage. Yeah. So if that's we, incredible. Uh, it's good. <laughs> it's good. Um, keeping in mind, I really think this is a device that everybody needs. Yeah. Since when you've reached, you know, like under 3000 people. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, a lot of people are going to need this. And I mean, it's a thing that you just keep at home and mm -hmm. you stretch and you check. Your, it's also measurable. Now that it's a fixed item, you are the variable. And so yeah. you can check whether or not your calf has become tighter by your regression relative to your angle. Um, yeah. So in other words, you get your hip to the wall today, but not tomorrow if something's going wrong and you know. Wow. Dude, that's awesome. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. So yeah, so you've got what a you've got Indigo. So Indiegogo is that how does that differ than Kick? There's just two different platforms, Kickstarter and Indiegogo. Um, Indiegogo. Indiegogo is great. Indi um, basically, Kickstarter. In, you can start your crowdfunding on Indiegogo, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but I'm on Indiegogo in demand right now, which mm -hmm. means I've already done a crowdfunding campaign, and now um, you you can continue to pre-order before I can go into it full production and give you like two day shipping. Yeah. So it's, it's, wow. the, it's, a, it's a bridge. Yeah. So the, so you've raised more, a little bit more on Indiegogo than Kickstarter and they're two separate. Are they two separate? Uh, no, it's, a, it's things. the continuation. So Indiegogo okay. is very clever. They show you what you've already raised and they add to it. Okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. So you, you kind of start with Kickstarter and if it works, then you could get on like Indiegogo and then they say, Hey, this is what we've done and we're going to leverage more people or different people or yeah because when your kickstarter ends like it ended on the seventh yeah uh, why stop i mean um i'm going i'm, I'm building the prototypes i'm building the uh, tooling right now in china i'm mm -hmm. um, like you know this is this is a piece of the calf pro being made right now yeah uh, that's the you know that's a that's a, the tooling the, the mold to make you know a piece of it um i'm not ready to you know i don't have any calf pros to sell right now but why not continuing to continue to build what we started on Kickstarter? And that's why you continue on Indiegogo. Got it. Got it. Okay. Okay. I got it. Cool. Cause I've never done crowdfunding myself, <laughs> you know, but this is, this is an awesome. So you've got like over 3000, something like 3000 units pre-sold over $300,000 raised. Right. One, how did you, I want to know, like, how did you get the idea? Like, how did you get it on Kickstarter? So is it just people asking you, hey, Dave, can you sell these to me? And you're like, okay, maybe I've got something here. Yeah. Let me so get it on Kickstarter. My patients wanted them, right? And, uh, and I knew that they would. So I, I actually fixed things with it. Yeah. So, like that gave you, gives you a confidence that, okay, this isn't just a crazy idea. Um, yeah. And so, you know, but I couldn't make them. Like people are saying to me, can you make, please, like Dave, please, can I just have your office one? And I'd say, you know, you don't understand. It's a 3D print. It cost me fourteen hundred dollars to 3D print. It's not really a viable thing to sell that to you. <laughs> you know, it costs like it took me like seven days to print that. Right. Wow. Um. So it's going to production in China. You got to pay for pay for tooling. Um. To, tooling's thirty thousand uh, dollars. You know, I have three kids now. I'm not going to just take thirty thousand dollars from somewhere and go pay. By the way, it's just for tooling. Then I need to actually do my first production run. We're, we're talking big numbers now and I haven't got a single unit sold. And I'm mm. like, and my wife's like, how do you know these are going to sell? You're going right. to do all that. And then what are you going to do? Store them? <laughs> like it, that's why Kickstarter is really a good idea. Yeah. This too. Um, it's basically what you're doing is you're proving the idea by selling it first and delivering it you're, later. You're making yeah. like your first purchase order. Yeah. Yeah. I did that with the cash PT blueprint when I first okay. launched the idea. There you go. I was like, I think this is going to be a good idea, but I'm not 100% sure. And my business coach at the time was like, well, Aaron, just build a sales page and launch it to your email list. And yeah. Well, well, you already had an email list, so that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you get, so was it, so you get on, you get the idea on Kickstarter and they just start sharing it out to their people and you get your, some of your patients to go buy it? Like, how does that whole process work? Okay. So it's actually, it's a, there's so much that comes before that. Yeah. Um, and I, I have to tell you, like, it's been quite a journey. Like what, a, like it's been a steep <laughs> learning curve. Um, but you basically have to build an email. You do a pre campaign before you mm -hmm. do. Campaign. Okay. Um, and you know, that involves, you know, Facebook ads, you know, you're testing your audience. You're seeing if people are interested. You're just doing signups on Facebook. Mm -hmm. 
Facebook ads, showing the product. How do you show the product if you don't have it? Like, right. So I had to make one, I, there's only one car pro that exists right now that uh -huh. looks like this. Um, this was made at my factory. Um, and the only way you can sort of do a Kickstarter is if you have one to show. Right. So how do you, like, there's, a, there's many steps to begin with. Um, and that, you know, that was, that was a very expensive prototype. Yeah. Because there's only one. Um, so you've got to make the item once, film it like it's, like everybody's got them, um, and then test your audience to see if they're willing to sign up, at least give their email, and then do that mm -hmm. over and over and over again until you have an email list. And then yeah. tell that email list that you're launching, build up your, your, your launch, and on launch day, hopefully you'll get a pretty good response. Then you switch to like, trying to market your live campaign. It's, it's a lot, it's very involved. Yeah, that's incredible. So what's the timeline on this process? When did you, when did you do that first 3D printed uh, model? When was that made? 2018. Okay. And the one behind you that's blue, when, when did you get that one made? Uh, that is the, the factory prototype. That yeah. was made uh, July last year. Okay. And then when did you launch on Kickstarter? Uh, 7th of April. 7th of April. And then you sold out in 30 days, basically sold out in 30 days. Um, like that. Well, or what, um, I mean, it said, you know, like, I don't know, like, what does it mean? Like, what does it mean when Kickstarter says uh, funded, funded, funded in 30 minutes or funded in 30 days? I mean, what's um, so basically, you, you, you create a threshold that, you know, if you reach this amount of funding, you can start your project. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, I made a, a $10,000 funding goal. Okay. <clears throat> to at least know that if I've sold ten thousand dollars worth of units, this is a viable thing. Right. And we did that in thirty minutes. Nice. Yeah. Nice. That was cool. Um, so oh, it's yeah, live, you know, and, and that's exciting. And yeah. you know, this goes along with you know, I think you you had some side hustle. You posted something about what's your, what's your PT side hustle? Right. Um, you know, I guess this is part of my side hustle. This is part of the the, the manifestation of a passion that I have that you can't. I can't serve so many people in my lifetime in my office, mm -hmm. but hopefully I can serve millions of people by making a product. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. That's important. Cause I mean, like just talking to you, I was like, okay, what is the thing I was going to ask you about this? Like, what is it that, why is it so important to you to keep pushing? Like what's given you the drive to make sure that you get this thing to market and you get it out in front of people? Um, it's, it's solving problems. So like, you know, we, it's something that, that I need. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, when it comes down to it, um, when, the way you build your practice, the way you make a product, the way you do anything, it has to be a win-win. It, it has to work for you and other people at exactly the same time. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we're at Disney and, and my wife's limping because she's got a pain in her left arch. Now, you don't see that as a calf problem. That's a calf problem. Mm -hmm. um, and I've got my calf pro at the hotel in Disney. And I'm like, honey, you need to stretch in the car for She's like, oh, you and your car for And I'm like, seriously, it's not gonna, I have a problem in my arch. I'm like, trust me. 30 yeah. seconds, she stretches, she walks around, she's like, all right, fine, you're right. You know, I love, you know, you love hearing that, right? <laughs> um, and, and it works. So when you can solve a problem that easily, you know, you get a pain in your arch that keeps going on and on, you're gonna go to the podiatrist. Who knows what treatment you're going to get? And a cortisone shot? I mean, that's all, that's not what you want. Right. Yeah. Uh, and to be able to fix something that easily, that's pretty exciting for me and for the person who receives that treatment. Right. Right. That's awesome. So is the goal, I mean, really to get this in front of the consumer's hands, not just physical therapist's hands? Oh, yeah. So th this is not, so this is any physical therapist who's smart enough to have one of these in, this, in their office will have a, a better treatment for foot and ankle for the patient. Mm -hmm. But this is, this is for everybody to have at home and treat themselves. Um, I sort of have a mission that I would like people to be able to take care of themselves. Yeah. Um, and, and they will always need to come to the PT to, to, to have some manual therapy or to check that they're doing the right stretches. But to be able to continue self-management, like I think that there's a huge hole in education of the human like in, in school, how do we take care of our physical hygiene in terms of stretching and how do we bend down to pick something up from the floor? What is a squat supposed to look like? Mm -hmm. How do we sit at our desk? 
it's all missing. And like, this is part of that journey of self-care. Yeah, that's awesome. Are you creating like educational materials around this for clinicians or consumers or? Um, yeah, so this is the beginning of a self-treatment system. Mm -hmm. um, the calf was the, 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 the stretch number one, which is what this is for out of 10, is the only one that needs an actual tool because mm -hmm. the calf is so heavily leveraged. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is the beginning of a, I guess you could, the system that I'm currently using in my office could be a physical therapy method. Mm -hmm. It could be for all physical therapists to use, but it's also a self-treatment method. So right. either you're foam rolling the component or your physical therapist is doing the manual therapy on that component, but it all, it all fits into it, a treatment. Yeah, that's awesome. David, if someone is listening, is like, I've got a great idea and I should put mine on Kickstarter. <laughs> What's the number one thing that they need to know you know, before like taking on all of that stuff. Oh, they need to know they're solving a problem. Yeah. They need to know that uh, it's not an esoteric, uh, tiny little piece of physical therapy that nobody cares about. Um, they've got to be, they have gotta have, they've got to come up with something that solves problems for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, everybody walks, so I'm, I'm pretty confident that this solves problems for people who have pain in their foot, ankle, or knee. Yeah. Um, it's got to not be just because they want to make a product because they, they want to sort of exit physical therapy and have an online business. That's not a reason. It's because I want everybody to have one of these because I know if they stretch on that before they get on the treadmill, they'll reduce their risk of injury, which I mean, you, you just miss one injury and this has paid for itself 10 times over. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Did as the coronavirus and you know, the pandemic kind of started, you know, like let's say, spread it becoming more of a like so you launched this back in like let's see april, what you said, april right? right like bad times right like, bad times like uncertain times right bad time to be launching anything right but it was launching <clears throat> and so what were you afraid was going to happen and and what did you have to change anything you know so in your launch plan because of what this? i was afraid would happen happened and that is yeah. we got absolutely no media coverage mm -hmm. um no one was interested because everybody's interested in COVID right now. Right. Um, I feel like it could have been totally different with, you know, the Today Show want to talk about stretching your calf. Yeah. <laughs> they don't want to talk about that right now. Right. Um, Men's Health Magazine. I'd love for them to show everyone that they can use a tool to stretch their calf now. Oh, oh, so much media, you know, so many media outlets could have been involved, but we're not. So, you know, this is a bare bones Kickstarter without the media coverage. And that was what I was afraid of. And that's what happened. Mm -hmm. um, but that's okay because, you know, sooner or later I'll get it out there. Um, I'll, I'll, I want it, I, I, I need the basketball players when the NBA comes back to be stretching their calves on the calf rope. Right. And so when they're, when they're stretching and, and you see it, we'll be fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. and they'll be fine because, you know, they don't have a good calf stretching treatment. If you're Kevin Durant and you didn't stretch that calf strain, you're going to end up popping your, your Achilles. And that's what happened. Mm -hmm. Like, that's really sad. He had a problem right. with the calf before he ruptured his Achilles. Right. And, you know, I saw an NBA player last week, uh, a Miami Heat player, because I just DM'd the hell out of him. Yeah. Um, and I said to him, what were they doing to treat your Achilles? And he goes, they just sat me on the bench. Ah, <laughs> no. Um, you need the car pro. And so I got him to come to my office and I did treatment with him. You know, we, you know, we were wearing masks. This is, mm -hmm. this is, um, this is cash PT 2020. Right. And, and it's fine. Um, it's great. Uh, all my patients, I actually give them masks, um, if they need them. Um, but we're in a better position as cash PTs than the mills right now. Mm -hmm. uh, this, is a, this is a great time to be a cash PT as far as I'm concerned. Oh yeah. You know, I, it's funny because, you, you know, I've been saying for a few years, I'm like, well, look, one-on-one -on -one therapy doesn't matter unless someone's been somewhere and they've been one on many and they hated it. That's the only time it's mattered. Now I think it's one of those things where people are like, Oh gosh, one on, I'm the only person in your office at a time. And you know, you're already in, and, and, and from our aspect, like we're already set up to like, that's how we like, you know, most of us like to do therapy. <laughs> yeah. You know? No, they, they, this is, this is better now. Like before we were sort of, I think before we were kind of thinking, 
as a cash PT, we're trying to struggle to explain ourselves. Mm -hmm. We're trying to show how we were better than the mill, even though we don't take insurance or I don't even look at insurance. Um, now we're kind of like a little bit more attractive, I think. Um, right. Have a little personal care, something to do. Like my patient is saying, I got your appointment's the only thing I'm doing today. Right. Um, and they're excited. Yeah. Um, you know, we take appropriate precautions. Um, yeah. One at a time, everyone's wearing a mask. It's clean. Um, you know, we talk about this. And, you know, I think we're in a better position now than ever before. Yeah. Did you bring it up? Like, what are, is there anything specific you're doing besides wearing a mask? Is it like, are you doing specific sanitizing or spacing between patients? Or is there anything that you're um, doing that's drastically different? Basically, I make it very obvious that I'm washing my hands between sessions. Yeah. I say, One second, just going to wash my hands, right? I hope mm -hmm. you have it well. Um, of course, I don't wear gloves because I feel that that barrier is not necessary. I know glove wearing is huge right now, but... When you're wearing a mask, um, you know, really, you, you can't catch the virus through your hands. I mean, it's not a wart. Um, you, you, you just keep washing your hands um, and you don't touch your face or your mucous membranes um, and you touch your patients mm -hmm. um, and you wash your hands again and you just keep covered. Um, and you can make sure your patients are covered. Um, if they have any signs of illness, they're definitely not allowed to come. Right. And you power on. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting. It's like, it's one of those things where there's not a lot of information that I've found. It's like, definitively, this is how you should do it. You know, and it's like, but it's also our common sense and as healthcare providers to make those decisions for ourselves and our patients. Right. I think that we understand also, I mean, you remember doing acute care and we understand droplet transfer and we, we sort of understand a little bit more and we're also educators. So we, we have to mm -hmm. tell our patients, this is relatively safe. In fact, this is really very, quite safe, it's safer than going to the supermarket as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, you know, that person standing at the checkout port thing has seen so many people. Um, and you know, we, you know, you keep a certain amount of distance, but you get in there when you have to do your soft tissue work. Um, but you know, you explain to them, you know, keep your mucous membranes to yourself, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, keep them covered, don't touch them and let's do a session. Yeah. 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 That's awesome, man. Well, what, uh, what are your goals? Like, what does the next two, three years look like? Um, I want to I roll out sort of helping people to take care of themselves even more. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, I'm really, I, you know, I look at my, my children and I look at the people around me and kids and all the people who know me in my community. And there are so many little pains that people should really just know how to deal with by themselves. Yeah. But there's so much they can do on their own and it doesn't take away from our ability to service their needs when they still want to come and see us it's not cannibalizing what we do it makes us the the mentor of that practice in a sense um, they still want to come and see us and make sure they're stretching correctly but i, I want to make sure they're actually doing stuff on their own first mm -hmm. um, so yeah i want to i want to be able to provide more of um uh, giving people a way to treat themselves um and that that means sort of uh, first line of, of defense is actually prevention. Um, I think American healthcare is very uh, retroactive or, or tertiary intervention, I think they call it. Right. You only fix things once they've already happened. Um, Self-care begins with having good stretch hygiene, um, knowing to stretch before activity. And a lot of people say to me, well, actually, there's a general that said stretching before activity is not good for you. That's not true. I mean, it, it's not true for an Olympic sprinter but it's true for a desk sitter. Right. And we're all desk sitters or we're all sitting in cars. So you do need to stretch those hips and, and the calves and all the rest of it. So yeah, I guess I'd like to see my producing more, like helping more people than people than just people in my office. Yeah. Also that's a win-win because as a physical therapist, there is a finite amount of time that you will be able to be a physical therapist. Mm -hmm. And that is really true. Um, especially as a manual therapist, because as a cash PT, uh, you are, I, I, as far as I'm concerned, you, you, you I mean, I'm not going to say should, I don't like that word, but being a manual therapist gives you an advantage. Um, so, you know, you're doing stuff all day, you know, you do that for 20 years, you know, that might be the amount of time that you, that might be enough. Mm -hmm. 40 years might be really enough. Um, I think I've been doing this for 15 years already. Um, I would like to transition at some point into doing slightly less. I've already transitioned into doing less hours at the office yeah. um, and, and more of leveraging myself. 
that's that's really the plan. Yeah, that's awesome. How else are you leveraging yourself, your time, your expertise? Besides, are you, is there something else besides treating patients in the calf pro? Are you doing other things too? Uh, yes, I do make custom orthotics. Yeah. Um, so part of solving problems I found right at the get go was alignment of the foot and ankle. Mm -hmm. um, didn't believe in orthotics when I was studying. I thought, oh, it's so dumb. Um, but actually, it's not dumb. Uh, actually, I can't solve plantar fasciitis. Uh, tibialis posterior tendonitis and a few other conditions without putting an orthotic in the shoe. Mm -hmm. um, so I make my own. Yeah. Um, I bought a machine from Switzerland, set it up in my office. I have my own orthotic uh, lab here. So that's another thing that I do. Um, yeah. And I'm, and I'm working on a few other things as well. That's awesome. That's awesome. So you got, so as an entrepreneur with some great ideas, how do you keep the, how do you know when they're good and when they're bad? Or like where, when they're just like the idea of fairy and you need to leave it alone? Yeah, that's a really, that's a deep, that's a really good question. And I think it goes back to the, what, how do I launch a product on, on Kickstarter? And that yeah. goes down to, is this something that people need? Mm -hmm. um, um, it's gotta be, it's gonna, it can't be about you. It's gotta be about solving problems for other people. Yeah. That's and like amazing. when you're gone, cause we're all gonna be gone. Um, you, you want to be able to make something that people can still use when you're not here mm -hmm. and that made a difference in the world. Cause like life's short. Uh, what difference are you going to make? You know? Yeah. Yeah. So it's like your legacy. Like what's your legacy going to be? It's going to be to allow people to, um, treat themselves first line of defense before they have to go to, into a healthcare office. And yeah. I want to know that they feel confident to try a system and then they can succeed because Basically, the method has been tested in my office and people are actually able to fix themselves using that method. Yeah, that's powerful, Dave. So, Dave, if someone wants to learn more about uh, you um, or check out the Calf Pro, where, where should they find you online? Um, Instagram um, is Calf Pro. Um, it's pretty simple. <laughs> um, you can Google Physical Therapy Miami Beach uh, and find my website, which is a really long one, which is Physical Therapy Miami Beach uh, <laughs> .com. Um, Anatomy Physical Therapy Miami Beach .com. See how long it is. Mm -hmm. um, um, I'm David Baruch on Instagram as well. Uh, Dave Baruch, I think I am, underscore, Dave underscore Baruch. Um, you can go on Indiegogo right now and see my product, which has, you know, there's a lot of videos there that can go through and just see all the information, see the product. Um, yeah. Uh, by all means, you know, write me an email. Um, I'm, I'm pretty responsive on my phone. Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, thank you. Um, is there anything else that you think uh, would be helpful for our listeners? I would say anyone who's going to actually, so, you know, when I think about you, I think about helping people transition from being a salaried employee to having their own business. Mm -hmm. and I think about you a lot, you know, random times think about how that was really the, that's the hardest part. Um, yeah. And, and I would say, you know, you've got you to gotta be ready to offer a different experience in multi facets and be excited about that. Um, you wrote, I think you wrote a post recently about don't make it hard for people to buy things from you or something yeah. like that. I mean, God, don't make it hard for people to buy things from you. Um, have online sales for the products you sell in your office, even if it's just a single visit that they can buy and then attend or mm -hmm. I mean, I would say to everyone, sell packages. Please sell packages. Um, it, you're really selling a plan of care, and that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, give them a discount for prank paying up front. It, it's a win-win again. Give them a big discount, huge discount, but get them into a plan of care so you can make a difference because ultimately you see them one visit, and you're probably not going to make a difference so much. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So much to say about that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that's awesome. Um, well, thanks for coming on the show. I mean, dude, just seeing what you're doing. I know you're like, man, my, my launch didn't go as, as well as I should have. And, you know, a lot of things didn't, but there's plenty of time to do that. But you've had some incredible success with, with your clinic and the CAF Pro. So, I mean, congratulations. Thank you, you know. so much. Um, yeah. And thank you for being there for our community. Um, Absolutely. You know, you don't realize who you're touching when you keep posting. It's so hard to keep posting. Oh. Um, and, you know, even if I just catch you once and you say something, that sticks with me and it might change the way I, I operate my practice from now on. Automation, automation, you know, like, so I appreciate what you're doing. I really yeah. appreciate it. Thank you.
Absolutely. Thanks, Dave. Um, I look forward to catching up with you in like another few months or a year or whenever to see how this is uh, going and launched um, and seeing it in person sometimes. So um, thanks, man. Well, hey, this is the Cash Media Lunch Hour podcast. This is Aaron LeBauer and Dave Baruch. Um, we'll see you guys on the next time. And look, I would say my last parting thought would be my, my takeaway from Dave is if you got some great ideas, just make sure that they're, you know, what people want and then go make differences in people's lives. Yeah, we'll see you guys on the next show.